This morning, we are continuing with our Romans preaching series, and the title of my sermon this morning is From Groaning to Glory, and the text is from Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 27. You know, in the month of May, we received news from our uh, beloved brother, Subash in Nepal, uh, about the passing away of a good friend of his, a young pastor by the name of Pastor Lomas. Pastor Lomas had contracted COVID-19 and in a short period of time, in just a few days, he succumbed to the virus and passed on, leaving behind a very young wife and two very young children to fend for themselves in a very uncertain future. And not long after that, Subash himself came down with COVID-19. And it was not just him. It was also his wife and his mother. And of course, when I heard news about uh, uh, Subash coming down with COVID-19, I immediately texted him. I called him. But uh, there was no response. He did not reply to my messages. He did not pick up my call, uh, which was unusual of him because he would normally respond immediately. And then a few days later, he sent me a text on WhatsApp, and this is what uh, his text uh, read. My head is spinning and feel like bursting. Severe headache and body ache. Feel sleepy, weak, and fatigued. No energy. Sorry. He was not able to respond because he just didn't feel physically strong enough to do so. You know, at one point, uh, some time later, his condition turned for the worse. When um, he caught a, when he developed a chest infection and caught pneumonia. And uh, he reported uh, afterwards that uh, his lungs had been 70 to 80 percent affected by pneumonia. And because of that, he had to be transferred from the isolation center to a hospital where he could get urgent medical treatment. Thankfully, uh, the worst is over for Subash. He's now on the road to recovery. Uh, The moment of crisis has passed, but he is not yet completely out of the woods. His mother and uh, wife, uh, they had tested negative for COVID-19, but he is still COVID-19 positive and surely we need to continue to pray for him Subash is on the road to recovery but only after suffering for a period of time you know many of us might not have contracted COVID-19 but a lot of us are victims of COVID-19 we are secondary victims of COVID-19 we have suffered the backlash of COVID-19. Some of us have lost our income because the jobs we are doing uh, are deemed non-essential by the government. Some of us have lost our jobs. Uh, For those of us who are in business, our businesses have taken a severe hit and some of our businesses are in danger of folding. And our children, our children are really struggling with uh, having to do classes online. And you know, uh, all this has taken a severe toll on people, a severe mental, a severe emotional toll on people. Someone shared a newspaper headline from a Malay newspaper that reported that 266 people had taken their lives because they had incurred deaths because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And just a few days ago, the Chief Minister of Penang, YB Chao Kon Yao, reported that uh, since January, one life had been lost every three days due to suicide. And just recently, the Royal Malaysian Police reported that nationally, two lives are lost to suicide every day. And Recently, you know, because people have been hit financially, there is this white flag campaign where people who struggle to put food on their table 
have taken to flying the white flag outside of their house uh, so that they could receive help uh, from strangers, from people uh, uh, who, who are compassionate and uh, these people would bring supplies to these people in need. Or maybe during this time you are uh, experiencing some other form of crisis. Perhaps you are having a crisis with your health or your relationship. But whatever crisis you are in, uh, this is a time where a lot of people are suffering. And in this time of suffering, many people are experiencing all kinds of negative uh, emotions. Fear, anxiety about the future, even confusion, uh, perplexity perhaps, and even anger. Anger that uh, uh, people are hit with this difficulty during this time. And you know, uh, some people, because of all the troubles they are in, may have lost their desire to continue to live, which is why we are seeing a rise in suicide rates. And so as we look into Romans chapter 8, from verse 18 to verse 27, we see Paul addressing the subject of suffering and groaning. In the first part of Romans chapter 8, from verse 1 to verse 13, Paul uh, uh, dwelt on the subject of life in the Spirit. And from verse 14 to 17, uh, these are uh, transitionary, uh, these are transitionary verses that shed light to the rest of chapter 8. Romans 8, 14 to 17 uh, is a transition from the subject of life in the spirit to the subject of suffering and groaning. Last week, Pastor Elvin talked about the Holy Spirit as being the spirit of sonship how the Holy Spirit brings about adoption to sonship for those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to read to you from Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 15 to verse 17 to refresh our memory. Verse 15, The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And Paul tells us in these few verses about the new identity, uh, identity that we have uh, if we have believed, if we have put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this new identity as God's children. And as God's children, we become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That means we can expect an inheritance from God. And surely an, an, an inheritance from God uh, must be an inheritance that is beneficial, that is pleasant, that is profitable. And we can have this assurance of sharing in the glory of Christ in the coming kingdom of God. But then in the second part of verse 17, Paul drops a bombshell. This is what Paul said. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Paul has just said something unexpected, something perplexing. Paul, what do you mean? Are you saying that with sonship comes suffering? Is that what you are saying? That suffering is part of the deal? You know, Pastor, Pop, uh, Pastor Bob Deffenboff uh, made this observation about suffering and sonship. He says that there is actually purpose, purpose in suffering. This is what he said. 
suffering is a necessary prerequisite to the full benefits of sonship. Let me say that again. Suffering is a necessary prerequisite into the full benefits of sonship. What he's saying is this. If you want to experience the full benefits, not just the partial benefits of sonship, then you must go through suffering. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if we share in his sufferings. What does this mean? We must suffer in order that we may also reign with him. Now, we may be thinking that, you know, perhaps Paul is saying this to the believers in the church in Rome. But notice what he had written to the church at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, this is what he said uh, to the believers there. Philippians 1, 29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him the way paul has put it it is as if suffering is a privilege given to believers a privilege bestowed upon us now it is very important for us to understand what it means to share in the sufferings of christ definitely it is not suffering for the wrong reason I can tell you that many times I have suffered because of my own foolishness, because of my sinful nature. That is not the kind of suffering that Paul is talking about when he talks about sharing in the suffering of Jesus. What does it mean to share in the sufferings of Jesus? It means to suffer for the right reasons. And hear the words of Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 to 12. Suffering for the right reasons means this, being insulted, being persecuted, being falsely accused on account of Jesus. On account of Jesus. Suffering for the right reason. You know, my brothers and sisters, Paul is making a very important observation here. And this is something we must understand. Paul is saying that suffering is the experience of every son, every daughter, every child of God. Therefore, it must not strike us as strange when we suffer for him. Our present life inescapably involves suffering and groaning. Not easy to take, right? You know, when uh, you first heard the gospel, when people witnessed to you, did they tell you that you would have to suffer as well? I'm sure you were told of the benefits of being a son of God, of being a child of God. Uh, the gifts that you would receive, the blessings you would receive from being a child of God. And uh, very rarely do we hear that following Jesus means having to suffer as well. But I want us to pay attention to what Paul said in the next verse. In verse 18, this is what he said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Words of encouragement, words that uplift us. It is as if after giving us a bitter pill to swallow, Paul now gives us a sweetener. Paul tells us that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Perspective, my brothers and sisters, perspective is very, very important. Paul is saying it is important to have a clear view, a clear picture of the glory that is linked to suffering. We must have that understanding. We must know that our suffering does not compare with the glory we will share, we will receive as sons of God, that the glory of sonship 
far outweighs the sufferings we have to go through. It is not worth comparing. It is as if we are comparing glass to diamond. No comparison at all. Paul, in another letter to another church, the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 37, uh, he talked more about this glory that is linked to suffering. In verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is what he said, For our light and momentary troubles, light and momentary troubles, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now Paul is making uh, comparison and contrast here. Paul is saying troubles are light. The glory to be revealed to us is weighty. It far outweighs all the troubles we are experiencing now. Troubles are momentary, temporary, for a season. But glory is eternal. But the problem is this. The problem is glory is in the future. Presently, we cannot see that glory, although we can expect to receive that glory in the future. But presently, it is unseen. But our troubles, our sufferings are in the present. But remember, what is seen is temporary, momentary. What is unseen is eternal. And so Paul says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Now, I do not think that Paul is making light of troubles and sufferings. Sufferings hurt us. Sufferings inflict terrible physical, mental, and emotional pain. Suffering can be almost unbearable. Suffering can increase to such a degree that, you know, causes us to just want to scream with terror and pain and plunge us into paralysis. We cannot function anymore because of all our sufferings. Now, if I were to tell you that the sufferings we are going through now is light and momentary, I would not be credible. But these words come from the Apostle Paul. And uh, Pastor Ray Stetman made this observation about uh, what Paul uh, has said about suffering and how suffering, uh, the suffering that we experience now is for a moment, light and momentary. Listen to what uh, Pastor Ray Stedman has to say about uh, the suffering that Paul went through and the suffering that we will have to go through. Now that statement would be just so much hot air if it didn't come from a man like Paul. Here is a man who suffered intensely. No one in this room has gone through even a fraction of the suffering that Paul endured. He was beaten, he was stoned with rocks, he was chained, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked, he starved, he was often hungry and naked and cold. And he himself tells us this, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22 to 33. But yet, it is this apostle who takes pen in his hand and says, Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That glory, the glory that is coming, is incomparable in intensity. So what Paul is saying is this, the intensity, no matter how intense the suffering is, the intensity of the, of the suffering we experience now is not even a drop in the ocean compared to the glory, the weight of the glory that is surely coming. You know, we can endure suffering if we have this perspective. 
we can even triumph over our suffering if we can see the glory that is to follow our suffering. You remember what happened in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen was stoned because of his testimony, because he boldly testified about Christ. In verse 55 and 56 of Acts chapter 7, we read, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, I see heaven opening and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen was able to endure suffering and even death because he saw the glory that he was about to receive. Suffering to him uh, uh, is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to him. And so, my brothers and sisters, there is a biblical principle that we can learn here. And this principle is this. First, suffering, then glory. First, suffering, then glory. And Jesus exemplified this. Jesus suffered first before he entered into glory. And you know what Paul said? Paul said that when we suffer, our suffering produces groaning. My wife will be able to tell you that I groan a lot. What is groaning? Groaning uh, refers to a deep inward response to suffering. Groaning is a personal and intense agony, agony that cannot be put into words. And in this part of uh, Romans chapter 8, Paul mentioned three kinds of groanings. First, the groaning of creation, the groaning of Christians, the groaning of believers, and the groaning of the Holy Spirit. Let us look at the first groaning, the groaning of creation. Romans 8, reading from verse 19. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Pay attention to these two words, in hope. We will come back to, that, uh, to this later. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. What is Paul saying? All of creation is suffering. All of creation is in agony, right up to the present time. Time. And why is creation suffering? Why is creation groaning? The answer is simply this, because of Adam's initial sin. Creation has been suffering the backwash of Adam's sin. I want to quote Pastor Ray's statement again. This is what he said about the suffering of creation because of Adam's sin. He said, creation fell with man, the apostle declares. Not only did our whole race, our whole human race, fall into the bondage of sin and death, as the earlier chapters of Romans explain, but the entire physical universe fell as well. It was man's sin that put thorns on roses. Do you believe that? It was man's sin that made the animals hate and fear each other and brought predators and carnivores into being. With the fall of man came the spreading fear, hostility and hatred in the animal world. And the whole of nature testifies to this fact. It is, as Paul describes it here, subjected to frustration. 
creation is subjected to frustration. Why? Because creation has been serving a divine sentence of corruption and futility. Futility means hopelessness. Creation, because of this futility, is in bondage to what? To corruption and to decay. Every living thing will experience degeneration and decay. Look at our own body, our human body, our physical body. In time, we will lose our hair, we will lose our teeth, our knees will become weak, we will lose some of our bodily and brain functions. And it is futile because these things are inevitable. These things cannot be reversed. And so because of that, there is a sense of hopelessness. My brothers and sisters, everything, everything breaks down eventually. And the final blow is this, death. The final blow is death. Creation has been suffering from Adam's initial sin and creation continues to suffer because of the ongoing sins of man. You know, because of man's insatiable greed, because of man's desire to accumulate, to become rich, to have more and more and more, we have exploited uh, our natural resources. We see pollution, we see deforestation, desertification, and the extinction of species. The world is suffering. The world has suffered because of Adam's sin and because of our, of our ongoing sin, creation continues to suffer even more. But in spite of this suffering, in spite of this being subjected to frustration, there is good news because creation has a sure and certain hope. Remember what I said about these two words in hope in verse 20? Creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Creation is serving a divine sentence, but subjected to it in hope. There is hope. The suffering and groaning of, temp of creation is temporary, and there is hope. And we are told that creation eagerly awaits the day of its redemption. And when will that day be? When the children of God is revealed. This refers to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ himself returns to the earth with the saints, with the children of God, the revealing of the children of God, to establish his uh, throne to subdue his enemies and to rule over God's creation. And under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, creation will be set free, set free from its bondage to decay and be brought into the glory and freedom of the children of God. At that time, creation will prosper creation will no longer groan but creation will thrive but until that day creation as paul says creation suffers birth pangs but with the promise of a glorious delivery life and liberty let us now move to the second groaning the groaning of the christian the groaning of believers let me read from Romans 8, verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And so like creation, 
believers, Christians like you and me, we also groan. We groan uh, because of the present corruption and futility we see without, outside of ourselves and inside us. Outside of us, without, we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world where wickedness is present, evil, injustice, violence. And at times, we have to partake the fruit of evil and wickedness. At times, we have to suffer from the wicked acts of evil men. At times, we have to bear false accusation. At times, we suffer violence because we live in a fallen world. But I want to talk to you about the struggle that we experience within. Our bodies, because of Adam's initial sin, our bodies are subject to sin and corruption because we have, we have inherited from Adam a sin nature. And in Romans chapter 7, the preceding chapter, Paul described this inner conflict, this struggle within the believer, this struggle between uh, the sinful nature and the spirit nature, how the believer struggles to subdue the sinful nature, uh, the, the, the flesh, in order to live a life that is led by the spirit. There is an internal struggle going on even now because of our sinful nature. The truth is this, my brothers and sisters, though we ourselves are redeemed in the spirit, but our bodies are not yet redeemed. We are not yet fully redeemed from this body of sin as long as we live here on earth. Why do we groan, my brothers and sisters? We groan because we are aware that something is very wrong with us, with the way we are and the way that the world is. We groan because we want to be rid of this earthly body, this body that is subject to corruption and decay and sin. We groan because we long to be given a new body, a redeemed body, a body that is free from sin, from decay and death. We groan because we understand not only what we are now, we are sinful, we are evil, we are wicked, but what we will be someday in the future. We groan because we have not yet entered into the full benefits of sonship, because we have not yet been fully redeemed in our bodies. My brothers and sisters, I want to ask you, do you have this longing? Longing to be set free from your sin nature? I have this longing. At times, I feel very fed up with myself. I feel very disappointed with myself. Why I still struggle with sin? Why is it that I cannot be victorious all the time? Why is it that I struggle to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit at all times? I struggle and I long to be free from, from this struggle. I long to be free from sin's hold over my life. You know, the reality is this. Paul said that we only have the first fruits of the Spirit. Paul said we only have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have not yet experienced the full manifestation of the fruit which the Spirit produces. What this means is that even though we have the Holy Spirit, we are just experiencing the first fruit and not the full manifestation. We have just a foretaste. We have not received all the fruits in full. And because of that, consequently, we are still groaning inwardly. Why we groan? Because we wait eagerly for our adoption, not just to sonship, but to full sonship, the redemption of our bodies. 
I want to quote to you what Pastor Ray Stepman said. He said, Nature groans, we groan, and yet the groan is producing the glory. Every time we groan because of our struggle to be rid of our sin nature, every time we groan, it is a reminder to us of the promise of glory. I do not think anything will transform our sufferings more than remembering that. So my brothers and sisters, remember when you are suffering, when you are groaning, don't just focus all your attention on the suffering. Think of the glory that is linked to your suffering. And Pastor Bob Deffenboff says this, God causes us to groan over the present conditions under which we now live so that our hope will be directed towards God's coming kingdom. So, let us place our hope in God, for it is in this hope that we are saved, the hope that we shall one day receive the glory uh, that has been promised to us. And now we look at the final groaning, the groaning of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with with the will of God. My brothers and sisters, Paul speaks of two certainties in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 27. Two, two certainties. The first is this, the certainty of suffering. We cannot escape suffering. But he also speaks of another certainty. And what is this certainty? The sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit. And isn't that wonderful? We can be certain of the sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit to help us through the seasons when we suffer and when we groan. You know, as mentioned earlier, suffering can bring about intense physical, mental and emotional torture, causing us to despair and feel a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. It can sap our energies. It brings about negative and adverse effects. And many times, many times in the midst of our suffering, we find ourselves at a loss as to what to do, at a loss even as to how to pray and what to pray for. But the encouragement is this, the sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Paul says, helps us in our weakness. Do you feel weak now? Good news, the Holy Spirit is here to help you in your weakness. And what is our primary weakness? Paul says, we do not know what we ought to pray for. That is our weakness. We do not know what to pray for. We are at a loss, we are confused. So Paul says our weakness lies in our inability to verbalize our pain, our groanings, our suffering. You know, when you try to counsel a person who is suffering, many times this person does not even know how to put into words what he or she is going through. It is almost impossible to verbalize our pains. And when that happens, you know, we do not know what to ask for in prayer. Our groanings, our pains are beyond the ability of words to communicate. But the good news is this. When this happens, when we feel at our weakest, the Holy Spirit steps in. The Holy Spirit intervenes. And He does this by interceding for us. He prays on our behalf. Isn't that a wonderful encouragement? You can be sure 
that Jesus is praying for you at all times. You can be sure that the Holy Spirit is praying for you, translating your groans into prayers to God. You know, when the Holy Spirit prays for us, He communicates to God by translating our groanings, our wordless groanings to God. He, convey, he conveys to God what we cannot put into words when we cannot speak or when we do not know what to do, the Holy Spirit speaks for us to God. You know, it has been said that the Holy Spirit is the communicative link, the communicative link between our own heart and the heart of God. It is heart language, groanings, and the Holy Spirit is that communicative link that links our heart to the heart of God. And there's one other thing that is very important that we need to understand. When the Holy Spirit prays for us, when the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with prayers and petitions and requests, He will do so in a way that is consistent with the will of God. You know, we don't know what to pray. We don't know what is the will of God. But when the Holy Spirit prays for us, He knows He will intercede for us according to the will of God. Verse 27 tells us, And He who searches our hearts, He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. My brothers and sisters, many times I think our prayers can be selfish, can be self-centered. We pray our will, we pray our kingdom into being, we want to do that. But we can be assured that when the Holy Spirit prays for us, He always prays in accordance with God's will. And that which is in, in, which is in accordance with God's will, my brothers and sisters, we can always be sure that it will always be good. It will always be beneficial. It will always be profitable for us. I'm going to go to verse 28 of Romans chapter 8. I know that Dr. Theo Bunwei next week will be uh, preaching from verse 28 and following. So Bunwei, I'm going to uh, borrow verse 28 from you uh, for this morning. We all know Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things, my brothers and sisters, not some things, not even most things, but in all things, when the Holy Spirit prays for us, when we are suffering, when we are groaning, when we are in pain, when we cannot make sense of what is happening to us, when we feel that you know God has abandoned us, when the worst things have happened to us, we are told that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. Why? Because the Holy Spirit prays God's will to being, to fulfillment in our lives. So let us take courage. Let us take joy in this fact, in this truth. I want to conclude now. Pastor Bob Deffenboff made this uh, perhaps strange observation about suffering and groaning. And this is what he said. Groaning characterizes the life of the spirit-filled Christian. Let me say that again. Groaning characterizes the life of the Spirit-filled Christian. How so? Because we live in a world that is subject to corruption and futility. And not only that, we are also living in bodies that are subject to corruption and futility as well. And because of this, We groan because of the Holy Spirit living in us. There is a dissatisfaction with uh, the way we are. Because of sin in our lives, there is a dissatisfaction. Therefore, 
when we groan, it is because we are struggling against our own sin, against our imperfection. You know, we should be dissatisfied that we are presently, that what we are presently falls far short of what God intends to make of us when he completes his redemption when he completes his redemptive work in us we should be groaning because there is a dissatisfaction because we are not yet what we should be we are not yet what we want to be according to god's purpose you know my brothers and sisters god does not intend for us to be contented with what we are with our situation with our condition now and therefore god through his holy spirit is creating in us a hunger for glory a hunger for heaven you know i will always remember what our late pastor prem said to me uh, i do not remember his exact words but uh, this is what uh, he said that i can remember he told me that you know I cannot wait to go back to be with God. You know, when I'm done with uh, whatever God wants me to be doing, I will not want to stay even one day longer. Such a desire, such a dissatisfaction with this world of sin, with this world of struggle. You know, our sufferings and our groanings have this purpose. They are intended to prepare us for our future sonship, for our future glory. I want us to remember this. Suffering is preparatory for sonship. And groaning is preparatory for glory. Always remember that. And so, if I may, let me encourage all of us to groan, to groan inwardly as we long, as we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. Let us groan and let us fix our eyes and place our hope on things to come. The eternal glory promise us, the eternal glory that far outweighs our light and momentary troubles. The glory that God has promised us. And my brothers and, brothers and sisters, because this hope is not presently seen, we must fix our hope by means of faith and not by sight. I want to end now uh, by reading to you two verses from Romans chapter 8. Again, I'm borrowing from uh, Boonway's message next week. Uh, Romans 8 verse 29 and verse 30. And let us be encouraged by this assurance that we have. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified suffering is part of sonship but suffering will bring us to the full benefits of sonship and our groaning our inward groaning is preparatory for the glory that we will receive let us close in prayer now Father God, we want to thank you for your word this morning. We want to thank you for this reminder that because of the fallen world that we live in, because of our fallen nature, our sinful nature, we will suffer. And this is what you have told us, that we can be assured of the certainty of suffering in this life. We want to thank you that in the midst of our suffering, O oh Lord, we have the promise of your Holy Spirit. We have this promise that your Holy Spirit sustains us in our suffering. And even though we groan, we know that our groaning uh, 
and our suffering will achieve for us something glorious, something that will far outweigh the suffering and the pains that uh, we have to go through. Thank you, O Lord, that your Holy Spirit lives in us. Thank you, O Lord, that your Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, in times of our suffering and pain. Thank you, O Lord, that uh, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with your will. And where we can be sure that uh, when the Holy Spirit prays for us, when he communicates our groanings and conveys them to you, O Lord, we can be sure that you are working out your great plan and purposes in our lives. And that God, we can be assured that all things will work out for good because we love you and we have been called according to your purpose. So Lord, help us to have uh, a good understanding, a true understanding of the suffering and groaning that we go through. To know, O oh Lord, that uh, we can look beyond our suffering and our pain to the glory that will be revealed to us, to the glory that we will receive as your sons uh, in the fullness of time, in the coming of your kingdom. Thank you, O Lord, for your word to us, for your encouragement to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to read to you a passage of scripture uh, as benediction. It is taken from Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the King and answer us when we call. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week ahead. Again, fathers, I urge you, if you have not done so, to please sign up for the World Needs a Father workshop starting this uh, Tuesday, the 6th of July. God bless all of you. Take care and stay safe. And see you next week uh, during our online service. God bless all of you.